All right, so in 4-4, obviously we talked about trig functions of any angle. So now we're moving around our unit circle. We're going outside the unit circle and we're using it with the right triangles, the combination of the two. So this one says, given that cosine of theta is negative 5 over 13 and the sine is greater than 0, find the following. Because those angles are not on my unit circle, I know immediately I have to draw a right triangle. Okay, so you can draw it however you want as long as you realize that visually that doesn't make sense if it's a negative x. So I don't care if it's in the right qu quadrant as long as you would know how to apply the signs. Technically, if I have a cosine that's negative 5 over 13, the radius is always positive, right? Which means I have to move back. So you could put a negative 5 here and a 13 here, or you could draw it where it's supposed to go, which would be negative 5 for right now at least, 13. And then you have to look at the second piece of information, which says sine has to be greater than 0. That's how you identify what quadrant it would be. If sine's greater than zero, that means it's positive, correct? Which means this has to be in the second quadrant. In order for cosine to be negative and sine to be positive, it's gotta be second quadrant. Which means that my y is a positive 12. So 5, 12, 13 is your triple, okay? And then you would need to use both pieces of information, the fact that cosine is negative and sine is positive to know which quadrant this triangle would lie in. Everybody's good on that, right? Okay, then the sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which is 12 over 13, and the cotangent would be adjacent over opposite, which is negative five over 12. I think most, if not all of you got that right, so that's good. Number three said evaluate the trig function. So we're looking for the tangent of 13 pi. Don't go around your circle like six and a half times. Realize that that's a whole number and the whole numbers are either even or odd. That classifies what side of your circle that's on. Because you wouldn't want to, if I give you the tangent of 113 pi, you should be able to get it just as fast. You don't want to have to convert. Like I've seen people convert this into degrees, find coterminals. That's a lot of work to do for something that should be quick recall. So if it's odd whole numbers, we said it's on the left, which is a negative one zero. If it was even whole numbers, it'd be on the right, which is so even odd. Okay, so the fact that 13 is odd tells you I'm using the coordinate point that's on the left. And the tangent is the y over the x, or the 0 over the negative 1, which is 0. Easy stuff. Don't make it harder than it needs to be, okay? Number four said find the reference angle, then evaluate the trig function. So I could figure out where this lies, because at some point you're going to, it might say graph both of these things. Negative 3 pi over 4 means I'm moving clockwise instead of counterclockwise. This would be negative half. If I went all the way to the x-axis, it'd be negative 1. And 3 fourths would be in between the negative 1 half and the negative 1. So I know my angle is in the third quadrant. Now a reference angle is the distance between that angle and the x-axis. So I only have to go one more fourth to hit that pi. Which means that my reference angle or theta prime is pi over 4. If it is a unit circle angle. So if it is an over 4 or an over 6 or an over 3 or an over 2 then the reference angle is pi over the denominator. It doesn't matter what it is. If I gave you 231 pi over three, that's a bad example because that can be reduced. 232 pi over three, your reference angle is pi over three. You just gotta figure out from that, where does it go in your unit circle, okay? So I know that the reference angle is pi over four, which means the coordinate point there is root two over two and root two over two. And then because it's in the third quadrant and all students take calculus, which of my six trig functions would be positive? Third quadrant T means tangent and cotangent. Everything else is going to be negative because I'm going back and down in that third quadrant. So they're both negative. So secant is the reciprocal of cosine. I'm going to take two and root two negative and flip it rationalize it to root 2 over 2, which is negative root 2. Cindy. So you're finding the distance, no matter where you are. So the first thing you do is figure out where that, that triangle, I mean, where that, that angle is, right? And then you're finding the distance between that angle and your x-axis. So if I'm here, okay, and it's a positive angle, it means it's bigger than 1. I usually do that minus pi. But because this is a negative angle, it's the reverse. So I'm going to do pi minus that angle. Pi minus, well, pi, the, minus the pi.
positive version of that angle. So pi minus 3 pi over 4 is pi over 4. Does that make sense? So you're always finding the distance between that angle and, and, and the x-axis. If it's positive, I just subtract pi from it. But if it's negative, that's where it changes because now it's a different direction. But the shortcut is every single of the unit circle angles. So every single, unless it can be reduced, every single over 3, every single over 4, every single over 6, and every single over 2, the reference angle is pi over that denominator. That's the shortcut. If it can, unless it can be reduced. Obviously, if it can be reduced, it's different. But every single one of those, the reference angles are the unit circle angles. It's when you change the denominator that you have to use the tricks moving around. So if it was something over 9 or something over 11 or something over 8 or something over, I don't even know, 7, then I got to figure out where it might lie. Does that make sense? And use your tricks as you move around. But if I'm giving it to you without a calculator, it's a unit circle angle because those are the only ones you can figure out without a calculator. It becomes 1 and 3 fourths pi. That's too big. It's got to be less than pi over 2. Right? You said if you do pi minus a negative 3 pi over 4. What if I do 7 pi? Right, which is 1 and 3. It's too big. It's got to be less than pi over 2. So you're doing 3 fourths pi subtracted from pi. Don't worry about the sign. Ignore the sign because it puts it in that quadrant, right? You're finding the distance from that to pi. So distance is subtraction. Take that 3 fourths and subtract it from pi. Ignore the yep, ignore the sign. Oh. Okay, so find the reference angle, then evaluate the, six, the trig functions. So now that we know the shortcut, what's the reference angle for 13 pi over 6? Pi over 6. Now I gotta use the 13 over six to figure out what quadrant this is in. So 13 over six is what in mixed number format? Two and one six. Odd whole numbers go where? I mean even, sorry, two's even. On even whole numbers go to the right. And then I have to go one six past that, which is less than a half. So I know I'm in the first quadrant. And in the first quadrant, what's positive? Everything, right? So the sign is going to be positive, and it's an over 6, which means root 3 over 2 and 1 half. Sign is a positive 1 half. So get your reference. Know your coordinate point from your reference. Figure out where it is on your unit circle, and from there apply your positive negative sign. Even if you messed up the positive and negative sign, if you knew it was over 6, you should be able to get all the values, right? Because you should know those points. You, you proved it to me on your unit circle quiz. All the over 6s are root 3 over 2 and 1 half. From there, you can get your sine, your cosine, your tangent, your secant, your cosecant, and your cotangent, and then figure out where it lies and put the positive negatives on it. All right, last one says the point is on the terminal side of an angle in standard position. Determine the exact values of the six trig functions of the angle. If the point is negative 3, negative 5, I know I'm outside my unit circle, which means I have to draw what? A triangle. So negative 3, negative 5 means I'm going from my center. Back 3, that's a negative 3. And down 5, that's a negative 5. So my triangle looks like this. The reference angle always goes in between the x-axis and the terminal side, which means theta is here. Is this a 3, 4, 5 triangle? No, why not? The 5 is not the hypotenuse, so don't make that mistake. That's an easy mistake to make, okay? So I could do negative 3 squared plus negative 5 squared, but the negatives are going to go away either way. So I'm just going to do 3 squared plus 5 squared, or 9 plus 25, which is 34. And the hypotenuse is the square root of 34. Good so far. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse, negative 5 over root 34, which becomes negative 5 root 34 over 34. Cosine is adjacent, negative 3 over root 34, which is negative 3 root 34 over 34. The tangent is opposite over adjacent, negative 5 over 3, negative 3, which is 5 thirds. And then come the reciprocal functions. Cosecant, flip it before you rationalize it. So root 34 over 5, and it's negative. Secant, 
root 34 over 3, and again it's negative, and cotangent positive 3 over 5. Questions? Mm hmm. All right, so the homework questions. This was number seven. It said find the reference angle theta prime for the special angle theta, and it gave you that theta is negative 305 degrees. So again, when you're trying to reference the negatives, there's two ways to look at it. One is work your way clockwise. So this would be negative 90, negative 180, negative 270, negative 305 puts you in that first quadrant. So then you'd be finding the distance between that negative 305 and if you're working backwards, it'd be between that and negative 360. The difference there would be 55 degrees. That's the one way to look at it, so 55 degrees, okay? The other way is, remember, like you can graph it as though it's positive, figure out where it's located, okay? So if I went positive 305, it would be, again, in this quadrant, I'd overlap it, and I still end up, fold it like a hamburger, I'd still end up in that first quadrant you're still finding the distance between that angle and the x-axis. So difference between negative 305 and negative 360 is positive 55. There's never an angle that's a reference angle that's bigger than 90, right? Or less than zero. So you're never gonna get a negative reference angle. You always wanna do the positive. And then it said sketch theta in standard position and label it, and then label theta prime. So the theta is your initial angle, which was the one we drew blue here. That's theta. And then theta prime was going the other way. This would be theta prime. Make sure you know how to graph them, label them, and find the functions. All right, so four said find the values of the six trig functions with the following information, right? So it gives you the function value of cosecant is six, and then the constraint is cotangent is less than zero. So your cosecant is positive. That's the first thing that you can get from that. And if your cosecant is positive, that means what else is positive? What's the, tri what's the, what's the reciprocal function for cosecant? Sine. sine. So sine is also positive. So I've got sine is positive and cotangent is negative, right? Which means tangent is negative. So as you go around, the first thing you can figure out is which quadrant this lies in, right? So I need sine to be positive. I need tangent to be negative. That rules out this one, and this one, and this one. This means this is happening in the second quadrant. That's one piece of information I can get from there. So how do you figure, because I get confused on like how to figure out the quadrant. So they're gonna give you some sort of information with a trig function, right? They'll give you the sine, the cosine, the tangent, one of those, and then one additional piece of information. Like it's either obvious like in this quadrant, or here's another piece of information that's gonna help you figure out this when they give you the reciprocal functions, both of those are reciprocal functions, the original functions have the same sign. So if cosecant is positive, sine's positive. If tan cotangent is negative, tangent's negative. So then I do my all students take calculus and figure out which quadrant am I talking about. In order for sine to be positive and tangent to be negative, so in the first quadrant, they're all positive, which means you can rule that one out. In the the fourth quadrant, they're both negative. Sine and tangent would be negative, so I can rule that one out. And in the third quadrant, tangent's positive, so I can rule that one out. The only one in which they are both sine being positive and tangent being negative is in the second quadrant. Does that make sense? So they gotta give you just enough to get you a spot. Then from here, if my cosecant is six, that means that my sine is one over six because it's the reciprocal, right? Yeah? Then draw yourself a triangle. So technically, if I want it to be in the second quadrant, I can actually draw the triangle going in that direction, left and up, and sign the, the reference angle is always in that corner where it would make with the x-axis, right? So the, the theta goes there, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so one and six. And then I gotta find the missing side, so one squared plus x squared equals six squared, and I get x squared equals 35, and x equals the square root of 35. But second quadrant tells you what's true about that 35. Negative. It's negative. So now it wanted the rest of them, right? So I already have the cosecant. I need the sine. I need the cosine. I need the tangent. I have the cosecant, so I need the secant, and I need the cotangent. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which is 1 sixth. 
cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, root 35, negative root 35 over 6. Tangent 1 over negative root 35, which is negative root 35 over 5, over 35. Flip the cosine, negative 6 over root 35, which is negative 6 root 35 over 35. And flip the cotangent, but flip it before you rationalize it. So it's just negative root 35. Other questions? Yep. Can you 11? 11. But it was graph it, right? Find the reference angle and then graph both or just graph... Well, it doesn't matter. I'll do both either way. So the reference angle, remember, you're doing the distance from that angle to the x-axis. So in terms of degrees, we're talking either the 180 or the 360 side of it. Because this is negative, I'm going, this would be negative 90, negative 180, negative 270, which means I know I'm in that first quadrant, negative 305. And if I'm going negative, then this is negative 360, right? If I was going around the negative angles. So I'm trying to find the distance from negative 360 and to negative 305. I'm trying to find what this is. So I just do 360 minus 305. Does that make sense? You're always finding the difference between that angle and the x-axis. So if it was on the left side, I'd find the difference between the angle and 180. On the right side, I'm gonna find the difference between that angle and 360. And it's always 90 or less than 90. It's not gonna be negative, it's not gonna be bigger than 90. So 360 minus 305 is 55, and it's gotta be positive. This is a positive 55. So your theta prime is 55. If you ever go to write an answer for a reference angle and it's bigger than 90, something's wrong. Less than zero, something's wrong. It's gotta be in between zero and 90 degrees. This was number eight. It says find the reference angle theta prime and round your answer to four decimal places. So 16 pi over seven is obviously not on my unit circle. 16 over seven is what in mixed number format? Two and two over seven pi, right? So I know two would go all the way around to the right hand side. Is two over seven bigger than a half or smaller than a half? Smaller than a half. So I know I'm in that first quadrant. With me so far? What's true about the reference angles in the first quadrant? They are what they are. I don't have to do anything with that, right? So my reference angle is actually 2 pi over 7. And this, I know in the homework it said to, to round it, but this kind of a question would be on your, the part of your test without a calculator. So make sure you know how to find that without it. So standard position... 2 and 2 sevenths pi is like that. Reference angle is just 2 sevenths pi, which would be that. Jasmine. So like 20 pi over 9. Okay. So 20 over 9 is still 2, right? Because it's 18. And then 2 ninths this time. So you're still going all the way around your circle once to the 2. And then two ninths, same question. Is two ninths bigger than a half or less than a half? 4.5 over nine would be your half, right? So it's less than a half, which means it stays in that first quadrant. And then your reference angle in the first quadrant is that fraction. So my reference angle is just two pi over nine. If it was bigger than a half, I would subtract it from pi. So if it was five pi over nine, I would do pi minus five pi over nine because now you're finding the distance on the other side. So same thing, this is 19 pi over eight, that's what you had? Okay, and it said reference angle, right? This is where you can't use a shortcut, so I can't just say pi over eight. So I gotta figure out, because those are, that's not on my unit circle, those aren't one of those special relationship angles. I gotta convert it first. So 19 over eight becomes two and one eighth pi, right? So two tells you go all the way around your circle, I'm starting here, and then one eighth, is either less than a half or bigger than a half. It's less than a half, so it puts it in the first quadrant. So I'd be at pi over eight here, or one eighth pi. And in the first quadrant, your reference angles are your reference angles. That's what the angle is, so it's pi over eight. If it was something like when I converted it and it was two and five eighths pi, so now I'm in this quadrant, now I would have to do pi minus five eighths and I get three eighths pi. 
So it can be something other than pi over whatever the denominator is. It just has to depend on where you're at. Number nine said negative, uh, find the six trig functions without a calculator of negative four pi over three. Did it ask you for the reference angle too? No. no. Okay. So negative four pi over three, although it's a good way to get it anyways. I know my over three is where my reference would be. And I know the coordinate point I want over three is what? One half and root three over two. Already you have that. Now all you got to figure out is your positive negative signs. Negative four thirds pi is negative one and one third. So I'm going back, that's negative a half, that's negative one, that would be negative one third. I'm in the second quadrant where just sine and cosecant are positive. Everything else is negative. So sine is gonna be positive, cosine's gonna be negative, tangent's gonna be negative, cosecant's gonna be positive, secant's gonna be negative, cotangent's gonna be negative. Sine is root three over two. Cosine is one half. Tangent is root three over two over one half. Keep change flip. And I get root three. Hannah. Why would you change it to the If it's obvious, go for it. But if you don't see that or you don't know where that's located, that's when I would say change it to the mixed number. If you can obviously if you know that that's on your unit circle, it's just reverse, then you don't have to. Yeah. Um, and then this would be 2 root 3 over 3. This would be 2, and this would be root 3 over 3. Everybody good? Okay. And then 10 said, find the indicated trig value in this specified quadrant. A lot of people just got confused on, like, the wording here. So if the function is the tangent of theta equals negative 2 over 3, the quadrant's 2, and you want to find the trig value of the cosecant, then basically work your way backwards. You're trying to figure out your triangle, you're putting it in the second quadrant, and then you're gonna find the cosecant on it. Two over three, again, as soon as you see it, you should know that's not on my unit circle, I have to make a triangle, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's drawn to scale or not, okay? If I put it in the second quadrant, technically it's going backwards and up, so my theta would be here, but you could draw it regular as long as you know which signs are supposed to be positive and which ones are supposed to be negative. If it's tangent, then it's what two sides? Opposite and adjacent, so this is two and this is three. And then the question comes, which one of those gets the negative? That's where the quadrant comes into play. So if it's quadrant two, what gets a negative, the y or the x? The x. So it's a negative three and a positive two. Pythagorean theorem gets you the other side, which is the square root of 13. And then cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so it's hypotenuse over opposite. Hypotenuse is root 13, opposite is two. And to confirm your positive negative sign, all students take calculus. If it's in the second quadrant, I mean, it, yeah, if it's in the second quadrant, then sine and cosecant should be positive. And we found this to be positive, so at least we know the sign's right. We good? Yeah? All right, so this is kind of like the warm-up where you're given one of the trig functions, and then this time, instead of giving me information about another trig function, I'm actually giving the exact location. So quadrant two means that this is obviously where my angle is gonna go. My tangent is six over seven, which means the if my theta is here, the opposite side is six, the adjacent side is seven, and because it's in the second quadrant, that tells you which of those to make negative, right? Because negative six sevens could be negative six over positive seven, or it could be positive six over negative seven. You've gotta know which one is negative, that's why they give you the quadrant. So in the second quadrant, your x is the negative one. Then I would close it in, do the Pythagorean theorem, so 36 plus 49, 85, this is square root 85. And then if you wanna find, what was it, cosecant? Yeah. That's the reciprocal of sine, so hypotenuse over opposite. Hypotenuse is root 85, and opposite is six. So the second piece of information is gonna give you the sign, positive or negative, for what your sides are. So this was the terminal side, lies on the given angle in the specified quadrant. Find the values of the six trig functions of theta by finding the point on the line. So the line is y equals 60 over 11x, and the quadrant is the third quadrant. So if I was to graph that, my point would be at zero, 
Okay, my rise is 60, which means I'm going up 60. My run is 11, which means I'm going over 11, and there's a coordinate point. So I've got a line that looks something like that. It's the same thing in the other direction, right? So it would be down 60 and over 11, back 11, which means negative and negative. And then if you do the Pythagorean theorem, this is actually 61, okay? That's not an easy number to know off the top of your head. You wouldn't get something like that without a calculator because 61 is not something you can like break down into its factor tree. And then from there, your reference angle is here Okay, which means that this is opposite this, this would be 60, this is opposite this, this would be negative 11. So both your sides are negative and your hypotenuse is 61. And then you could fill in your sides from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So it says that the terminal side is along that line, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're looking in quadrant three. So if I go to graph this line, I'd start at zero, I'd go up 40, I'd go over 9. That's really not made to scale, but you get the point, right? This would be my line. It would extend in the same way the other direction because it's a line, except that I'd be going negative 40, so this would be negative 40, and I'd be going negative 9. So the side lengths on that angle, which forms the triangle, would be negative 9 for the run or the horizontal, negative 40 for the vertical. And then when you find the missing side, you gotta do the Pythagorean theorem. So that's what, 1681, is that right? And is that 41? Yeah, I think it is. That would be a 16 if I could add. And then you've got the three side lengths and then you can figure out your trick functions and from there. How do you know where to put the theta? The theta is always the distance from the x axis to the terminal side. So if, it's, if my angle's here, let's say, then my theta goes here. If my angle's here, theta goes here. If it's here, theta goes here. And if it was here, theta goes here. So reference angle, think from x-axis down, up, in either direction. All right, so we're just gonna get a head start on four or five. So four or five is the graphs of the sine curve and the cosine curve. We are now taking the points around the unit circle and separating them out, putting them on an X, Y axis, okay? So we're gonna learn how to graph first the sine curve, then the cosine curve. I cannot stress the importance of these because next section, we have to learn how to do secant and cosecant, and those are based on sine and cosine. If you don't know how to do sine and cosine, you're not gonna be able to figure out how to do secant and cosecant. All right, so we're gonna walk through the first two in this section, and then also in that section's cotangent and tangent. Okay, all four of them are gonna be coming out of here. Zero, oops. So how do we get the sine curve? This is the standard sine curve or the parent function of sine, and it comes from making your x-axis, your x-axis, theta, so these are your radians, and the y-axis is your sine value. So if I overlap this with my unit circle, and you think about this being 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. Focus just on the sine, right? Because that's what this curve is. So if I asked you what is the sine at 0 radians, you'd tell me it's what? 0. That's where this point comes from. So if the theta is 0, then the sine is 0. What's the sine at pi over 2? 1. That's where this point comes from. What's the sine at pi? 0. What's the sine at pi, 3 pi over 2? Negative 1. And the sine at 2 pi? 0. And then if I filled in all the angles in between, all the over 6s is gonna, are going to be those root 3 over 2, right? Negative, that's here. Negative root 3 over 2, pos, negative root 3 over 2 here. The over 3 would be your 1 half. Other way around. This would be your 1 half, sorry. I was thinking cosine. That would be 1 half. This would be root 3 over 2. Then root 3 over 2. Then 1 half. 1 half. Root 3 over 2. Root 3 over 2. 1 half. So that's where those points come from to make this curve, okay? What we're going to do with this graph is just like all of the other graphs we've done, shift it. So it might go up, it might go down, it might be squished, it might be stretched, okay? And it might be reflected. So all of those individual parts are going to come from your shifts and I'll teach you how to figure them out, okay? But the, the sine curve pattern starts at the zero, goes up to the amplitude, down to zero, down, up. So it's 
zero, up, down, down, up, which is gonna change for the cosine. This is three full cycles. So one full cycle is what it would take to get around your unit circle once. If I keep going around my unit circle, do the values of the sine curve change? No, they just repeat, right? So that's what happens here. This would be one, what they call a period or a cycle. This would be a second one. If I move in the negative um, direction, I get the same curve. So it just repeats like waves, okay? It goes up and down and up and down and up and down the same distance. So the vertical distance is called your amplitude. The amplitude is half the distance between the maximum and the minimum values of your function. And it comes from A, which is in front of your trig functions, attached to it, not added or subtracted from it, but actually attached to the trig function. In the front is the A. And the absolute value of A is your amplitude. So I ignore the sign. The sign's actually gonna flip it upside down just like it normally does, it's a reflection. The period is how long it takes to complete one cycle of your curve. One up, down, down, up cycle. And that's 2 pi over b. The b is in between the trig function and the x. So in this case, it's in between sine and x. Whatever number is there is your b. And that's how long it takes to get from start to finish of one single curve. All right, so this is how your book says to graph. I'm going to tweak it just a little bit because in my experience, kids are better at multiplying fractions than they are at adding fractions with different denominators, okay? So you're going to start this, this with this point. Identify the amplitude and the period. So the absolute value of A is your amplitude. 2 pi over B is your period. And then once you get your period, so instead of number 2 listed here, you're going to take the period and you're going to multiply it times 1 fourth. And then you're going to do the period times 1 half. And then you do the period times three fourths. It's the same thing as adding the fourth of the period. So it's the exact same thing, just a different way to do it. This is going to give you three of your key points, and you need five. The first one is zero, unless there's a horizontal shift, which we'll talk about tomorrow. And the last one is your period. So whatever 2 pi is. If there's no vertical shift, these are your x-axis, I mean your x-intercepts. You're going to plot them on your x-axis, and then you're going to plot your amplitude. And then if it's sine, you're starting at 0, you're going up to the amplitude, down to 0. Negative amplitude, back up to 0. And then number five says extend the graph in step four to the left or the right as desired. So if it said to graph two periods or three periods, you would just continue that pattern going left or going right. All right, baby steps. Y equals two sine X. So because we're starting sine, make sure that obviously this is sine. Eventually, you're going to get them all mixed in. It could say sine, it could say cosine, it could say secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent. Make sure that's the first thing you identify. So obviously this is the sine curve, okay? Then I go, what's A? A is two, which means my amplitude is what? Two. That's how high it's going and how low it's going. What's B? In between the sine and the x is one. And the period is two pi over B. Or two pi. With me so far. Easy stuff, right? Same starting point every single time. All right, now I'm going to take that period. I'm going to multiply it times a fourth. It's in between the sine and the x. And since there's nothing there, it's a 1. I do 2 pi times a fourth, times a half, and times 3 fourths. I'd get pi over 2. Pi. 3 pi over 2. These are your standard key points, and hopefully that makes sense because 2 pi is your standard cycle. Now I draw my axis. And I do my key points. Now remember, these are three of the key points, but what's the first one? 
zero. And what's the last one? Two pi. Two pi. Okay, so before that comes zero and after it comes two pi. So I go pi over two, pi, three pi over two. Last one is two pi. You should have five horizontal key points. Then I do amplitude, which is two. So up two, down two. And then plot your curve. So sine starts at zero at the first key point, goes up to two on the next key point, down to zero on the next key point, down to negative two on the next key point, and then up to zero, and then connect your curve. Questions so far? I'm not, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna move on. <laughs>